mean, the stories are unique, but one of the things that I found is that the feelings that people have are almost always the same, that remorse, guilt, but just wanting to belong. Welcome to a special episode of the Mid-America PTTC podcast. I'm your host, Dave Clausen, and I'm the director of the Mid-America Prevention Technology Transfer Center. Now, many of you know that September is Recovery Month, and in honor of that, we have teamed up with the Mid-America ATTC to share some recovery stories from right here in our region. Now, each episode is a unique and very personal story. We are honored to have such amazing people offer their time and share their stories with us. Now, it's our hope that these stories will be a message that recovery is possible and together we are stronger. But before we get into the content, we would also like to thank our funder, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And although funded by SAMHSA, the content of this recording does not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA. All right, and I'd like to welcome Darla to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Now, for those listening, would you mind just sharing a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Darla Bellflower, and I'm currently living in Kansas City, Missouri, but I'm originally from St. Louis. I work um, in the field of social services, helping people who have mental health disorders, substance use disorders, and uh, housing challenges. I um, am a proud mother <laughs> um, <laughs> of a daughter who's graduated from college and out there doing her thing in the world and um, really very content and happy with my life right now. All right. I love that. And it sounds like you've got a, a very big heart for helping, helping others and serving them. Yes, I do. Yes. It is definitely part of my DNA for sure. Uh, I can definitely tell. And thank you for taking time to come on the podcast and share your recovery story. Absolutely. And, if you don't, and if you don't mind, you mind, can we just jump right into it? Yes, let's go. All right. Now, Everybody's story is a little unique, um, and I, I'd love to just just touch on, if you could share a little bit about, when did your use start? So, um, my use started ridiculously young. Um, I had just turned nine years old and went to a friend's birthday party just a few days after mine, and her mother was a dealer in the neighborhood and thought it cool to get all of the girls who were spending the night um, high. So we smoked marijuana at the age of nine. And um, what I remember about that night, which was decades ago, by the way, but what I remember about that night is I had always felt out of place. I always felt not quite like I belonged, not quite like I connected. Um, I felt, as they said back in the 70s, I felt kind of like a dork. And um, what happened that night when I uh, got high was suddenly I fit in and um, I was at ease and I was hip slick and cool at the age of nine. And um, for a lot of people, that may have been an isolated incident, but for me, what I believe now is that I have always had the disease of addiction, and that just started the road for me. I, um, my, I come from a family who has a history of um, substance use disorder, and from that moment on, I. Um, had this love-hate relationship with substances where I would uh, use and then try not to use and going back and forth. And it was a very difficult time, difficult couple of years. Um, and you're absolutely right. The feelings 
Uh, I mean, the stories are unique, but one of the things that I found is that the feelings that people have are almost always the same, that remorse, guilt, but just wanting to belong. That that gave me chills. Um, I imagine that that message right there about feelings not fitting in just just wanting to belong has to resonate with so many folks it just like i said it just gave me chills so thank you for for opening up and being vulnerable and sharing your feelings um, no so thank you very much uh, thank you that was that was very powerful um, sort of moving through your story um when did you know your use was problematic? I would say that I almost immediately knew it was problematic, even at the ridiculously young age that I was, because I continued to try to stop and I didn't have words for it. And there wasn't a lot of information that was reaching my myself at that, at that age but it progressed pretty quickly. Um, I continued to go to that friend's house and I continued to get high often. By the time I was 12, I was drinking and it was uh, blackout drinking at the age of 12. Um, and I just progressed, you know, uh, pretty textbook style. By the age of 14, I was using other substances and, um, um, by the time I reached high school, I definitely knew that I wasn't um, using substances and drinking in a way that other people around me were. My typical day was to wake up and before I even got out of bed, I was taking some pills and smoking a little marijuana and I would make a cocktail to take with me on the way to the bus stop. And that was pretty normal. And that was my day, day after day after day. Sometime during that time was um, the war on drugs started and Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I, I don't remember writing her a letter, <laughs> but <laughs> Some, I'm assuming that I was probably under the influence when I wrote her a letter. And um, I came home from school one day and my mom was like, you have a letter from Nancy Reagan. <laughs> oh, goodness. And I was like, um, okay. And apparently I had written her telling her that I, you know, because she was just say no. And I was <laughs> telling her that I just couldn't just say no. And so that, that was interesting. And that was also during a time when they started doing the late night commercials for the substance, you, uh, for the treatment centers. And I would start calling them and trying to talk to them late at night. But then they started calling back the next day. And, and that was pretty scary as well. But the moment that it really solidified for me, I was a junior in high school and I had asked to use the restroom during class. And I went into the bathroom and I had a small bottle of alcohol and the thought popped into my head, this is not social drinking. And, um, and so I started really thinking about that a lot. And I was probably uh, 16 or 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. So this is not social drinking. That was almost like an aha moment for you? It absolutely was. I, I was still having fun and going out with friends, but there was also a lot of things that were happening that felt very out of control. And the way, and I purposely would find people who like to party like I did. Mm -hmm. But even doing that, I, I just had this feeling that, um, that I was not going to make it out. Like I didn't, in high school, I didn't 
really have a goal. I, I do remember one teacher asking like the class, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and because I didn't think I would live to adulthood, I just said, well, you know, I, I think I'll be homeless and I'll be okay with that. Like I didn't have any thought of what would come next. Cause I never thought I would make it to the next. Very powerful. I, I, I can't even begin to to try to understand what that, that felt like. Uh, it sounds very interesting to me. Um, it, it's almost as though there's been these seeds planted over the years between the, the just say no and the letter from Nancy Reagan. <laughs> yeah. I love TV. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, yeah, I love the Nancy Reagan story. That's probably one of the funniest moments of me <laughs> trying to reach out for help was to reach out to the first lady to, <laughs> mm-hmm. and um, to get a letter back from her. And then, like you had mentioned, the, the late night TV ads and that the treatment centers actually started to call back too. Uh, so there's been, it seems, little seeds all along leading up to the, the aha moment as a junior. Yes. And so that same year, something happened that um, absolutely changed my life. And a lot of people choose to live their recovery anonymously and not share it publicly. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it is shame. Some of it is the profession that people are in. They don't have that luxury. Um, so there's just a lot of reasons, but I went to the second high school that I went to was for performing arts. And so there was a lot of teachers who had been in the entertainment industry who taught at that high school. And there was one day, um, also my junior year after I had that aha moment in the bathroom of this is not social drinking, where there was an assembly. And the dance teacher um, went out in the middle of the um, gymnasium, which was, or in the middle of the theater, which was a little bit odd. Um, You know, I had no idea why we were there. And she started her story by saying, um, you know, a lot of you know me and you know that I have danced professionally on Broadway. You know that I have had my own TV show, you know that I have had a lot of success. But what most of you don't know is that my name is Joan and I'm an alcoholic. And this was again in the 80s when it was not cool to be vocal and out about being a recovering alcoholic. And you could have heard a pin drop and um, my heart started racing and immediately I knew who I could go to Mm -hmm. with what I was struggling with. And so I like to think of Joan as, um, you know, uh, somebody who was sent, you know, to have this message so that I could, you know, get the help that I needed. But I still didn't know how to go and talk to Joan. And so I was not a dancer, but I signed up for her dance class because I thought maybe if I just got close to her, mm-hmm. I could, you know, kind of just tell her. And that year she hurt her ankle or something. And so she was teaching English and I was like, oh my gosh. So I finally just went to her and um, introduced myself and said, you know, I think I have a problem. And I had also been uh, attending, going to the National Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, which is the regional referral and treatment provider in St. Louis. It would be the equivalent of first call in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And um, I had started to go to some groups um, for children of alcoholics, because at this same time, while I was struggling with my addiction, I'm the youngest of five children, and literally all five of us, plus my parents, all have substance use disorder. So it was a very crazy time at my house. (laughs) Um, 
And so I had started to go there thinking that maybe that was the problem, that, that it was my mom, it was my dad, it was my sister, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't me, it was, you know, them. And so um, I went back to the National Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse and said, you know, I think I have a problem. And they did an assessment and um, said that they really thought that I needed to go to treatment. And I did what I thought was best, which was to graduate high school, pack up and move to Texas instead. Because <laughs> everything was going to be better in Texas. Um, and it was not. <laughs> um, I, I uh, was living between my two brothers' homes and uh, it just did not get better. So I, uh, within three months, packed up and came home and made a call to a treatment center and told my parents I'm going to treatment and I hope you give me a ride. Um, I was the first one to break that silence and that, that pattern within my family. Mm -hmm. um, my family, we all had a great time and we were the party family of the neighborhood and our parties were epic. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, within our neighborhood. And so I went to treatment at 18 and I did get uh, sober and I got off of the substances and came out into a great recovery community in St. Louis. Um, has a very strong recovery program or recovery community for young people. And, um, and things really just started to look up and I started to have hope and I enrolled in college, which I never thought would happen, but something else happened along the way because I was not anonymous within my family and that things started to get better for me. Then um, I, I guess I planted seeds along the way. And the first member of my family to also join me in recovery was my oldest sister. And uh, she got sober just months after I did. And then a few months later in the same year, my mother got sober, which was huge. Then it was um, a few years after that, that my oldest brother got sober. And then uh, several years after that, my another sister got sober. Um, so it, it was pretty incredible. So I didn't have to struggle with a lot of the same things that people who are in recovery when they go home for Thanksgiving have to struggle with, because there is no drinking in my family when I go home for the holidays. So I feel incredibly lucky about that. I know that my family is like a unicorn because that does not always or very rarely does it happen where the whole family gets sober. That's so interesting. And I, I love how you started that that trend. You, you were the first one, but then your family, after planting those seeds, sort of followed suit. Um, now you mentioned uh, you know, entering treatment and recovery at a, a rather young age. Um, how how's it been living in recovery from that age? Have there been any ups and downs or hurdles? There, there, there has. Um, when I went to treatment, I absolutely threw myself into my recovery and I participated in a lot of activities within the recovery community. Um, there is conventions for young people in recovery. And so I uh, participated in help putting that on. I uh, volunteered for the National Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse and the Speakers Bureau. And I did a lot of things. And like so many young people who get 
sober early, I decided, you know what? I want to be a substance abuse counselor because in the 80s, they called it substance abuse, which I'll get to later versus substance use. But um, so I went to school and everything went really well with my recovery. You know, there was emotional ups and downs, but for several years. And then I moved and pulled away from the recovery community. And um, I did relapse um, and return to drinking. That was a really difficult time for me because I had never chosen to live anonymously about my recovery. I absolutely hid my substance use and my return to drinking because literally everybody thought that I was in recovery. And so that was very painful and felt very shameful. And then um, I later found out that that <clears throat> for people who get sober at a very young age, they often will relapse thinking, well, I was just young. I you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Things will be different now. And for some people, that actually is the case. But that was not the case for me. And um, I was able to return to recovery. And then <clears throat> for over a decade again, and then uh, a little over five years ago, I had, I think it was my third knee surgery. And uh, started, you know, as most people do whenever they have major surgery, taking opioid painkillers. And within a very short period of time, I was misusing the painkillers and continued to take them beyond the, you know, recommended <laughs> time frame. And uh, that set off a series of events that was a very large relapse. And the shame that I felt from that was almost unbearable. I belong to a 12-step organization and I would go to meetings, but I would not tell anybody what had happened. And I held that secret for a long time until I couldn't hold it anymore. And um, the warmth that I felt from my community was unbelievable and the acceptance and the people willing to help me, even though I just felt unhelpable and unworthy. And that was five years ago. and. Um, I'm just extremely grateful that I made it through that because some people don't. And so I'm just, I'm just very grateful. And my family was very supportive during that time. So along that sort of journey that you're, you were talking about, um, what really helped you become sober again? Was it the, the family or the many hands reaching out and support from the recovery community? Um, my, I live in Kansas City and most of my family does not. I do have one sister here. Mm -hmm. And I would say that it was a combination. You know, my recovery community definitely held me when I held myself, held me up when I could not hold myself up. And the um, acceptance was um, from the people who were close to me was unbelievable. Even though there was shock and everybody had feelings about it, um, they were able to be there for me. And, um, you know, Within a short period of time, well, it wasn't short because it was about six months that I just felt that shame and um, it was difficult for me to talk about 
But one of the things, like I said before, that I've chosen is not to be anonymous. And so I couldn't be anonymous about my relapse either. And so one of, I really like music. And one of the songs that I absolutely love is by Macklemore. And he talks about his relapse. And one of the lines is, if I can be an example of getting sober, I can be an example of starting over. And so I had to almost chant that to myself, you know, and what I found was that my story was not unique, that there is a lot of people whose recovery is not in a straight line. It doesn't have to be that way. For a lot of people, it is, you know, that they get uh, sober and that's it. And they continue to live their life, the rest of their lives sober. But there are other people where that's not the case. And um, so what I found was that when somebody would come back to the recovery community after a relapse that I could share that with them. And I knew what that felt like. And I knew just the almost debilitating shame. And so that also helped me feel more a part of, um, Mm -hmm. because connection is very important. Yes, connection. And it really, to me, that just highlights the fact that together we are stronger. Absolutely. And that is the key for me. What I have, what I have come to is that the, you know, the two times that I have relapsed, it was because I was not connected and together we are absolutely stronger and so what I do today and how I live my life is I am really active in the Kansas City recovery community um I volunteer for first call which is the local referral and treatment agency within Kansas City and was super honored to receive the Volunteer of the Year Award. And um, I also uh, am the co-founder of the Women in Recovery Luncheon in Kansas City, and we are planning our third event for April 2020. Shameless plug for the Women in Recovery Luncheon. Um, (laughs) Absolutely. And where can they find more information about that? You can absolutely find more information on Facebook about that. All um, right. You can just search Women in Recovery Luncheon KC, or as we like to call it, the Whirl for Women in Recovery Luncheon Whirl. Okay. Um, but you can find that on Facebook. And I'm very active in the governance of my 12 step group. And I, you know, love just to be able to talk that language with my sisters and um and my family i I spent this weekend with my mother and it was just delightful to be able to have that common language Mm -hmm. and those feelings that i had of not fitting in and not belonging and not being hip slick and cool (laughs) um have have vanished because i absolutely belong and yeah yes you have that that true belonging and true authentic connection to others yes oh, yes absolutely now you had, you had mentioned uh, having the common language with your mother and other women in the recovery community um, i'd like to sort of dive into that piece a little bit around language and stigma uh, any any thoughts or insights you could share with us there? Yes, this is my kind of personal soapbox. Um, there, the stigma around substance use disorder, I think, is pretty evident. When someone is has diabetes, uh, and maybe their sugar levels get off. They are not shamed for it. They are not told that it's their fault. Um, You know, professionals 
work with them to get that back in balance. Same way with high blood pressure, same way with heart um, illness, like all of those things are not stigmatized the way substance use is, um, where people are blamed for it. And the language around that even speaks to that. You know, up until recently, the term was substance abuse, you know, which is a negative connotation. Um, whenever people would be using substances or return to substance use, they, it was said that they were dirty, you know, and that the opposite of that, then when you were not dirty, you were clean and sober, you know, as if that there, there was something bad or wrong uh, with you because of the use. So I try really diligently to watch my language and to encourage others and gently redirect when I hear that because I am not my illness. That is a part of me, but that is not who I am. Uh, just like if somebody who has diabetes, that would not be who they are. It's something they have. Very, very important. Very important and powerful. And that's something that we can all, as a community, as a field, as a human being, continuously work to get better at and help each other learn as well so even just just talking about the stigma and the difference and how important that language is can also help create that change so thank you again for yes. sharing sharing that with us um, I've yes got sort of three three final questions before we wrap up today um, what message would you want to give to somebody that might be seeking treatment currently I would say that substance use disorder is something that literally touches everyone's lives. Like, I cannot tell you the number of people that I personally know who has passed as a result of their substance use. Um, and I think that Almost everyone may know someone in recovery, but they may not know that they know someone in recovery because not everyone has the luxury that I have of not being an on this. So I would say that there is always help and that if you live in Kansas City, definitely call First Call um, or, you know, the Internet is a great thing because you can absolutely Google who to contact and, you know, there will be resources there for you. Uh, then if you live in a city that has the National Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, that is also a good place to call first. And those agencies are the referral agencies. So after getting some information, they can tell you where to go based on if you have insurance, if you don't have insurance and all of those things. And so rather than making multiple calls, calling one of those agencies first would be what I would recommend. Okay, great advice, great advice. Uh, following that same theme, what message would you like to share with uh, someone that is currently in treatment or living in recovery? I would say that, hang on, that it gets better and get to the middle of the boat and being active and sticking around and finding other people to not only do, if, if someone is part of the 12-step community, not just doing that, but going out for dinner or coffee afterwards and, and making friendships and making those connections. Um, almost all of my friends are now people who I've met in the recovery community, and it is wonderful. And I have a much deeper relationship than I ever thought possible with um, my friends because we do speak that common language and to reach out. And if you reach out, you will only have to do that once because after that, they got you. Mm -hmm. 
They got you. That's all it takes is reaching out and being involved. I love that. I love that. Uh, then the, the last question would be for, for those of us working in the workforce. Um, any, any advice or message you would like to give to them? I would. I, like I said, I have had the luxury of working in social services. So I do have the ability to be out and not be anonymous. Um, but not all professions are, are social work professions like mine. And so if if you are not able to openly share that with your employer or your boss, there are EAP programs. There is a number on the back of your insurance card <laughs> and you can definitely call that number and um, as a first step to move towards that. All right. And any, any thoughts on how folks in the workforce could support and serve somebody seeking treatment or living in recovery? Absolutely. I think that for me, asking questions is important. Don't make assumptions. Um, if, if you are someone who is not in recovery, but you have a coworker who is, and maybe you go out for happy hour, um, there is often this awkwardness of, oh, I, got, I don't know if I should invite her or not. Um, and that's why it's important to ask because everybody is unique and everybody is at a different place in their recovery. And where, you know, I would not have done that, you know, several years ago. I will go out and have some fried pickles and a soda with y'all, you know, but you have to ask because feeling included is important. I think also for me, it is important for people just to ask how I'm doing. There is someone at my work who has known me literally for decades and um, I am perfectly comfortable with him asking me, how are you doing? How are things going? Is there anything you know that I need? Um, so I think if you don't know what to say, you can start there. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. That just the power of asking a question and seeking to to understand you know, that, to me that that shows that you value and respect that individual or those individuals that you're you're speaking with. And it doesn't take much to just ask, like you were saying, "How is it going? How are you doing?" Very simple. Yeah, and and one of the things that I just had this thought, one of the things that has happened for me as the result of choosing not to be anonymous is that then people, whenever they find that maybe they have a problem or their family member does, they will come to me mm -hmm. because I may be the only person that they know who is in recovery. And um, so that has happened several times. And um, it always makes me think of that dance teacher back in high school, Joan, who, because she chose not to be anonymous, I knew where I could go for help. Mm -hmm. the, planting those seeds and, you know, giving that bit of hope and really living that you're, you are truly living that life that together we are stronger. You've got the heart for it. And like you said, it's in your DNA to help others. <laughs> It is, and that is definitely what has been a phenomenal game changer for me is being a part of, and we are stronger together. And if you think of a pencil, right, and you think of a single pencil, a single pencil, you can snap that pretty easily. But if you put five or six pencils together, it's almost impossible to break them. And that kind of speaks, it's a visual that speaks to the together we are stronger because that absolutely is what has been true for me. So true. I love it. I love it. And we here at the ATTC and the PTTC, 
we can't thank you enough for taking time to share your story and even more so be so vulnerable and share your feelings. Um, immense amount of courage and we, we greatly appreciate you and all of the work that you're doing for the field and the community and helping others. So thank you very, very much for coming on our podcast and I hope we get to talk again in the future. I hope so too. Thank you so much for having me and I hope that you have a great day. Thank you and you too.